السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقد تم لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم إن شاء الله we are begin this is going to be a four week session four week session on uh, introduction to fiqh introduction to the science of fiqh so we're not actually going to be studying any fiqh in this session right it's just going to be introduction to what is fiqh uh, some definitions uh, terminology we've heard the terms all right wajib fard what does it mean uh, sunnah mandub uh, and basic terminology we we'll also talk about you know what do we study uh, in fiqh uh, importance of fiqh uh, so this is what we're going to be covering, inshallah, in about four weeks, four weeks session. All right, so uh, in fact, uh, after knowing, after learning the, uh, the fundamentals of the religion, the things that make you a, a believer, and we went over that in the Hadith of Jubil, all right, after knowing the, thing, the things that every Muslim must know, after that, the most important thing a person must study is fiqh. All right, so after knowing the fundamentals of belief, the things that make you a believer, then there's nothing more important to study than fiqh. And the reason for that is that fiqh, uh, the, the consequences of it uh, in the next life can be punishment or reward, all right? Uh, as opposed to secondary matters of aqidah, all right? Secondary matters of aqidah or uh, tafsir of the Quran or hadith. These things are all important, right? These are all important, but in, this, in the grand scale of things, in terms of priority, the most important thing after the fundamentals of belief is fiqh. Because built on fiqh is determining whether there's punishment or reward in the, in the hellfire. Right? So it's more important for you to know what are the things that nullify your salah. It's even more important than to know how many gates there are in paradise. Not to say that this is not important, but we have to prioritize. Right? It's more important for you to know what makes your wudu valid or will make your wudu invalid, uh, then to know who is Allah referring to when He says, غَيْرُ الْمَغْلُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ uh, Not of those who have earned your anger, nor of those who have gone astray. Of course, we need to know these things, right? We need to know the meaning of Fatiha. But is there reward or punishment for if a person does not know this on the Day of Judgment? Is Allah going to ask you, what is the meaning of غَيْرُ الْمَغْلُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ And then punishment or reward? Maybe Allah will ask you about it. But there is no punishment or reward on these things because these things are not uh, wajib aini on a person. They're not individual obligations. Uh, but fiqh is an individual obligation. All right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you about your salah. All right? He might not ask you how many gates there are in paradise, how many gates are there in hellfire, but He will ask you about your salah. All right? He'll ask you about uh, your zakah. He'll ask you about your hajj. And upon these things are reward and punishment. Uh, there's a very well-known well hadith. Uh, this hadith is in the Sahihain, where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam marra Rasul, uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, ala qabrain. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi passed uh, upon two graves. And he said that, innahuma la yu'adhban. These two people, they're being punished. They're being punished in their grave. Uh, and then he clarified, uh, amma ahaduhuma fakana la yastanzihu, la yastanzihu min bawlihi. As for one of them, he did not use to guard his urine. He didn't use to guard his urine. So he would... Uh, urinate and then he would not take care to wash uh, properly and clean up properly and it would es essentially get on his clothing all right and what happens if you don't uh, if you have a urine in your clothing then your salah becomes problematic your salah becomes invalid and if your salah is invalid then now this is uh, potential punishment so this person is being punished why because he's not taking care of cleaning himself doing uh, stinja properly and as a result his tahara is not valid and as a result his uh, his salah is not valid and as a result, he's being punished. As for the other one, فَكَانَ يَمْشِي بِنْ نَمِيمَ The other one, he used to, he, he used to take, uh, tell tales and carry tales and backbite and slander other people and this used to go around. All right, so these people, they were being punished uh, in the grave. They are being punished in the grave. So, and this person, he's, the first one is being punished because he did not take care of, of cleaning himself properly. So, Fiqh is very important because there is reward or punishment based on that. Allah will ask you about your salah. He will ask you about your obligations. All right? Maybe He will not ask you about the tafsir of this verse all right? or the meaning of this hadith or how many wives did Rasulullah have 
or who are the ten promised paradise, these are all important information. But they're not as important as fiqh. Because fiqh, based on, based on what, if you're, you're praying properly or not, this can be determi determi determining if you have reward or punishment in the hellfire. So fiqh is very important. And so inshallah, we're going to have an introduction, basic introduction to uh, the science of fiqh uh, in these four weeks. Uh, we have a book here. I, I, uh, those who are part of the, uh, the WhatsApp group, all right, uh, I sent the link for the book. All right? So if anybody would like to purchase the book, it is there uh, in the WhatsApp group. There's an there's a Amazon link for it. All right? uh, so there's, this is a book. We're not going to go through the entire book. In subsequent sessions, inshallah, we will. Uh, but right now, we're just going to, in this opening session, we'll just be covering uh, the opening chapter, which is the introduction. Um, yeah, it's plugged in. But the TV's on. Okay, so inshallah, the first thing we'll cover, so this, this, this class, uh, we'll try to make it not as technical as possible, but we can't really um, avoid that, right? Because this, this, uh, this subject is a bit technical, right? It is a bit technical. So uh, we'll try to summarize it as much as possible and keep it as simple as much as possible, but there will be some technicalities due to the nature of the subject. Uh, the first thing, yeah. Yes, pretty much. All right. So there's also an Arabic book. Uh, I have it here. All right. Um, there's it's on, available online PDF if you want to order. You know, those who are proficient in Arabic, you can also get a physical copy of the book as well. All right. Uh, so <clears throat> the first thing we'll start with is the definition of fiqh. Right. The definition of fiqh. Uh, we'll read the Arabic inshallah, and then and then we'll read the translation as well. Madkhal fi ta'rif bi al fiqh wa masadirihi wa baadi mustalahatihi. On defining the science of fiqh, its sources, and some of its terminology. Yeah. It's not showing up. All right. Uh, bear with us, uh, inshallah, we have some technical things to sort out, and then we'll just start it back. Good? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what is uh, the definition of fiqh, right? We want to have a basic understanding of what fiqh is. Any Islamic term, right? Any Islamic term has a... Maybe it's not down. Should I scoot over? There's, there's a few other HMIs if you want to do what else. Okay. Yeah, it's coming in and, in and out. <laughs> no. I don't think so. I mean, it, it, All right, let's try a different uh, HDMI. Maybe this will. the tech guys. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll continue, inshallah, and um, um, hopefully we'll sort out later. <clears throat> All right, so in order for us uh, not to lose time, we'll continue, inshallah, and um, eventually, uh, if, if you guys get the book, or we can uh, eventually get it to work, inshallah. 
All right, so every uh, Islamic term, right, it has a original linguistic definition, all right, and it has a acquired Islamic definition, right? Any term, any Islamic term. For example, you have the term salah, all right? Salah has uh, an original linguistic definition, and it has an acquired Islamic definition. So does anybody know what is the linguistic definition of salah? in the language dua right so salah really means dua in arabic right allah says in the quran was salli alayhim meaning make dua for them make the dua for them uh, and e even in english uh, it's very similar in english right in english we use the word prayer but this can mean two things right it can mean uh, i did the asr prayer right the, the, the islamic de definition uh, and you can also say i prayed for you all right which is dua so even in English, the word prayer, it has both of those meanings. So similarly in Arabic, in Arabic you have salah. Original definition is uh, dua. Right? Salah means dua. The acquired Islamic definition is, we'll get to that later. All right? But there's an acquired Islamic definition, which we'll, when we study the, uh, the, the, the chapter on salah. Uh, so same thing for fiqh. Fiqh has a original linguistic definition. And it has a... Uh, acquired Islamic definition. So the meaning of uh, fiqh in uh, the language, the Arabic language, anybody know? Anybody knows the meaning of fiqh in the Arabic language? Good. Understanding or deep understanding, right? So this verb, faqiha yafqahu, it means in Arabic, fahima yafhamu, to understand. All right? And Allah uses this word in the linguistic meaning in the Quran. So for example, Allah says in the Quran, فَمَا لِهَا أُولَاءِ الْقَوْمِ Allah says, what is the matter with these people, referring to the hypocrites, that they barely understand a single word. And Allah used the word yafqahun, which is from the word fiqh. All right, so in this context, it means understand. For what is the matter with these people, that they, do, they barely understand a single word. All right, and another verse, Allah says, وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ Allah says in the, in the verse before that, that everything makes tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِن مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّهِمْ that everything makes tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ But you guys do not tafqahun. You do not understand. You do not understand uh, their tasbih. The tasbih of all created things. So everything makes tasbih in its own way. For human beings, our tasbih is saying, Subhanallah. All right? For uh, the, the animals, for the insects, for the birds, they make tasbih in their own way. وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ But you, uh, I mean human beings, we don't understand. The tasbih. And Allah used the same word, tafqahun, uh, which is from the, uh, the word fiqh, which is understanding in the Arabic language. Uh, then we have a hadith. All right, uh, Rasulullah says in a hadith, <coughs> uh, hadith is in Sahih Muslim, in Natura Salatu Rajuli wa Kisara Khutbatihi ma innatun min fiqhihi. That indeed the length, the lengthening of a person's prayer and the shortness of his khutbah or his speech is a sign of his fiqh, meaning a sign of his understanding. All right, so Rasulullah says that uh, for you to lengthen your prayer, lengthen the salah, make the salah longer, and make this, the khutbah shorter, then this, uh, when a person does this, this is a sign of their fiqh, meaning a sign of their understanding of the religion. All right, now we kind of see uh, the opposite happens, right? The, the khutbahs are extremely long, and the salah is, you know, uh, short. But Rasulullah says in the hadith that from the fiqh of a person, is that they lengthen the prayer and they keep the khutbah short. And this is the sunnah of Rasulullah and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So all this is the linguistic uh, definition uh, of fiqh. All right, as for the technical definition, right? So there's a technical definition, acquired Islamic definition. What is fiqh when we talk about it in the Islamic uh, sense? Uh, so there's actually two ways we can define fiqh. The first, is al awwal ma'rifatu al ahkam al shar'iyya al muta'alliqa bi a'mal mukallafin wa aqwalihim wal muktasiba min adillatiha at tafsiliya wa hiya nusus al nusus min al quran wa al sunnati wa ma yatafarru'u anhuma min ijma'in wa ijtihad all right meaning of that is the first technical definition of uh, fiqh is it is the knowledge of the rulings of the revealed law now knowing knowing the rulings right what is uh, wajib. And we'll see examples of that. What is uh, wajib? What is sunnah? Uh, what is haram? All right. Knowing these revealed laws, right? Knowing these revealed laws, 
that are attached to the actions and statements of those legally responsible. All right, so fiqh uh, it is essentially knowing the revealed law, the rulings of the re revealed law that are attached to actions, actions and statements, meaning it's not attached to beliefs. So a person uh, knows that, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is uh, one or there are uh, this amount of gates in paradise, right? This is a, a, a ruling, but it is a belief. It has nothing to do with action. So this would not be fiqh, right? Fiqh deals with actions. Fiqh deals with actions. So your beliefs, this would fall under another, uh, another science of Islam, which is aqidah, right? What you believe in. That would be aqidah. Well, when it comes to your actions, knowing the rulings of your actions, this is what fiqh is about, right? So fiqh is about knowing the, the, the related to actions and words, words, all right, uh, words. Uh, from those legally responsible, of those who are legally responsible, meaning the, the one who is mukallaf. Mukallaf means a person who has reached the age of maturity. All right? uh, fiqh applies to a person who has reached the age of maturity. And uh, that ranges right, depending on a person. Uh, it could be by age. It can be by uh, menstruation for the women particularly. Uh, it could be from a uh, wet dream. Uh, these are different ways in which a person reaches the age of maturity. But once a person has reached that age of maturity, then the fiqh, fiqh rulings uh, become ap applicable to them in the sense that there is based on that reward and punishment. All right, these rulings, where are they taken from? They are taken from the detailed proofs. The detailed proofs from the Quran and Sunnah and from any other source of Islamic law. So as we'll go over, Islamic law has sources. The primary sources of Islamic law are the Quran and the Sunnah. And then after that, we have two other primary sources, which is the consensus of the scholars, meaning when all of the scholars, they come together and they agree on a certain ruling. Right? All of the scholars, uh, they come together and they agree that this thing is mandatory. This is called consensus. In Arabic, it's called ijma'. It's called ijma'. So this is the third source. And we're, we're going over these, inshallah, uh, coming up later. And uh, another source of Islamic law is we call it in Arabic qiyas, which is analogy, right? So something, this particular thing is haram, all right? And we have something similar. So this particular thing is, uh, Rasulullah Sam said this is haram, for example. And then we have something similar comes later on. It was not around during the time of Rasulullah but it's similar to that thing that we said is haram, or what Rasulullah Sam says is haram. So by analogy, we can say that this is uh, also haram. For example, you have... Uh, various types of alcohol that were around right, during the time of Rasulullah All right, And they might have alcohol today that was not around during the time of Rasulullah But because it's similar in the effect, it caused drunkenness. So because it has the same effect, it's just, it takes the same ruling. All right? So this is called in Arabic, Qiyas. And <clears throat> we'll, we'll be talking about that later on as well. All right, so some examples of fiqh. An example of this is our knowledge that the intention for wudu is obligatory, right? When you make wudu, you need to have intention. You have to have intention. So knowing that this is obligatory, knowing that you have to have an intention when you make wudu, this is fiqh. This is fiqh. Uh, how do we know this is obligatory? We have the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intention. So we take from this hadith that any action we do must have an intention. All right, for it to be valid. So before you make wudu, you have to have an intention. Before you sal make salah, you have to have an intention. Uh, and any other act of worship we do must have an intention. So wudu, you need to have an intention. Knowing that this is obligatory, this is fiqh. Right? This is fiqh. All right, another example is intention from the night before being a condition for the validity of one's fast. So when you, when you, went up, when you need to fast in Ramadan... Right, you need to make the intention from the night before. Right, you need to make the intention from the night before. You cannot make the intention after dawn has arrived. You need to make the intention from the night before. So knowing that this is a requirement for your fast to be valid, this is fiqh. Right? Knowing this ruling, that it is required for you to intend the, day, the night before you fast, that I'm going to intend to fast tomorrow. This is fiqh. How do we know this is an, a, a condition? We have the 
a hadith of Rasulullah where he says, whoever does not have the intention to fast from before dawn has no fast. Right? This is a hadith collected in uh, uh, Sunan al-Bayhaqi and Darukhuti and others. So this is a hadith in which Rasulullah says that whoever does not have the intention to fast from before dawn, that he has no fast. So this, from this hadith we take that uh, a condition for your fast to be valid is that you need to have the intention from the night before. So knowing that this is a condition of fasting, this is fiqh. Right? Another example is the ruling of Salatul Witr. What is the ruling on Salatul Witr, anybody? What is the ruling on Salatul Witr? Depends on the school. Good, good answer. All right, so what school? All right, good. So in the Hanafi school, in the Hanafi school, Witr is wajib, meaning you have to do it. You have to pray Witr. All right, you cannot, you, after you pray your Isha, don't go to bed until you pray your Witr. All right, this is the position of the Hanafi school. All right, the position of the other schools is that Salatul Witr is recommended. It is recommended. All right, so knowing that Witr is recommended, this is fiqh. Right, this is fiqh. Now, where do we get that it's recommended and it's not wajib for those who say it is recommended? Anybody know or want to guess? Huh? Anybody know? All right, if we say, you know, everything we say when something is wajib, something is recommended, you know, we need to have, uh, you know, we need to know the, the real, there has to be a reason for it, there has to be evidence, right? Because when the scholars say that this is wajib, this is mandub, this is sunnah, they're not making these things up. Right, they are they're saying it based on evidence. Yes. Okay. Okay, but um so we say so, which is not wajib. So but what's the, what is what would they be the, the proof for that? Yeah. All right, so that's a proof that it's obligatory. Okay. All right, so that could, that's a proof for those who say it's obligatory, right? That, the, he said, do not leave the, the witr. What is the proof of those who say that it's uh, recommended? And this is the majority of scholars who say it's recommended. They have, we have the hadith of the A'rabi, right? Hadith of the A'rabi. There's an A'rabi, a Bedouin, he came. And he asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, about the obligations of Islam, right? Tell me about salah, tell me about fasting. And when he asked about the salah, Rasulullah said right, that there are five salawat right, that you have to pray. And afterwards, uh, the man asked him, do I have to do anything else? Do I have to do anything else? And Rasulullah said, no, illa anta tawa, except if you volunteer. All right, so the scholars have said that based on this hadith, it is proof that nothing else is, is mandatory except for the five daily prayers. Because otherwise, Rasulullah would have informed him that you also have to pray with her. Right? He would have informed him that. So this is the proof of those who say that uh, it is recommended, it is not wajib. They use this hadith of the A'rabi, the Bedouin. When Rasulullah told him that you have to pray five prayers, and he did not mention anything about witr, Right. So knowing that witr is sunnah, depending on the school you follow, uh, whether it's recommended or it is wajib, this is, right, this is fiqh. All right, another example of fiqh is uh, that it is disliked to pray after Asr, right? It is disliked to pray after Asr. After you pray the Salat al-Asr, right, you should not pray anything else. All right? You should not pray anything else. And this is based on uh, the hadith which prohibits prayer after Asr until the sun has set. All right? uh, so knowing this ruling, this is fiqh. All right? Or wiping over the head. When you make wudu, you have to wipe over the head. All right? um, do you have to wipe over the whole head? Do you have to wipe over half the head? Do you have to wipe over only part of the head? This is right debate amongst the scholars. All right, so uh, we'll go with the position that you wipe over. The minimum is at least part of the head. All right, and this is based on the verse where Allah says, "Wamsahu biruusikum," right, and wipe, or oh, wipe your heads. Wamsahu biruusikum, and depending on how we uh, interpret the ba in this verse, wamsahu bi, right, the, the ba here, and the ba has uh, maybe over a dozen meanings in Arabic language, right. Um, one of them could be for tab'id, which is partial, partiality. All right, so if we interpret the, the ba meaning to be meaning partiality, that means that you can wipe over a part of the head and your wudu is still valid. And this is a position of Imam Mashafi and his school. Right? And others say that you have to wipe over the whole head. And we'll get to that, inshallah, when we talk about uh, salah. But knowing the ruling of wiping over the head, this is, all right, this is fiqh. All right, so knowing the rulings, 
knowing the rulings, as all the examples you gave, this is fiqh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, good. Um, this, we actually want to talk about this a bit later on, but maybe we'll answer it now. Okay, so the question is, why can't I... Yeah, I'll, so I'll repeat the question. The question is, why can't I just uh, pick up Sahih al-Bukhari, or pick up the Qur'an, and uh, I read it, and I determine that, you know, I, b I basically, you know, determine, determine uh, how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can we do that? Um, you can do that if you have qualifications, all right? If you have reached a certain level, then go ahead and do that. Actually, it is obligatory for you to, for you to do that if you have reached certain qualifications. And this, this qualification is called in Arabic, ijtihad. All right, this is something called ijtihad, and the person who has reached this level is called a mujtahid. When you reach this level, and this is a person who has a proficiency in Arabic language, uh, you know all of the, uh, uh, the uh, all of the verses that related to ahkam rulings. You know all the hadith of ahkam. You know what the scholars have agreed upon. You know what they have differed on. There's a number of different conditions, uh, right, over a dozen uh, different conditions of uh, what we call ijtihad. Once you have reached this level, then you can directly access the uh, text of the Quran and the Sunnah. If you had not reached this level, then you're not qualified, all right? And if you're not qualified, then you need to follow somebody else who is qualified. All right, example of that would be um, if you want to study law, U.S. law, what do you do? You go to college, you go to law school, right? Does anybody pick up the Constitution and just start reading it and you become a lawyer, you become a judge like that, right? Nobody does that, right? And nobody would accept that you are qualified in in U.S. law, if you just pick up the Constitution, you could go and Google and you could download the Constitution, right? And you can, uh, I studied U.S. law, I read the Constitution. Nobody would accept that, right? So same thing, nobody will accept, and all fields are, are, are like this, right? All fields are like this. Everyone has their own specific qualifications. So just like, you know, when you want to study uh, U.S. law, you go to a law school. When you want to study Islamic law, you will go to a law school, which is the madahib and the schools of fiqh, right? If you want to study, uh, Islamic law, you will go to one of these schools and you would learn from them, from the school. All right? Just like when you want to study U.S. law, you'll go to a law school, you'll get qualified. If you want to become a doctor, you'll go to medical school and you'll become qualified. All right? So same thing when it comes to uh, Islamic law, you need to, if you haven't reached the qualification of being able to independently right, uh, interpret the Quran and Sunnah on your own, and there's qualifications for that, then you need to rely on somebody else's interpretation. All right? So that's the short answer uh, of that. All right, and we'll, inshallah, we'll get to, I think maybe in the last session, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the, the, the madahib, what are the madahib, uh, the schools of thought, and uh, some details regarding that, inshallah. All right, so we just went over the uh, definition of the fiqh, uh, the technical definition, which is, once again, to recap, uh, it is the knowledge of the rulings of the revealed law that are attached to the actions and statements. Are right, there we go. So it's on. Uh, back off, okay. Uh, that are attached to the action and statements of those legally responsible and are taken from their detailed proofs, which are the text from the Quran and Sunnah and what branches out from them. All right, uh, now this is one definition of fiqh. Uh, there's a secondary de definition, which is the revealed laws themselves. All right, the second definition of fiqh is the rulings of the revealed laws themselves. All right, so for example, a person says, I've studied uh, fiqh of salah, all right? Uh, that uh, the intention is wajib. That intention itself, all right, that ruling, that is fiqh. What's the difference between the two? So let's read the, the, the entire second, defi the second definition. The second definition is the ruling of the revealed laws themselves. And it is based on, uh, it is based on this that we say, I studied fiqh, I've learned or I learned it. This means that when you study the juristic rulings of the revealed law that are found in the books of fiqh, and these rulings are derived from the book of Allah, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the consensus of the scholars of the Muslims, and their judicial reasoning. All right, so very, to keep things very simplified, uh, the rulings of wudu, right, the rulings of wudu, that washing your face is obligatory, right, this is, that ruling itself is fiqh. 
right? That ruling of self is fiqh. Uh, in the previous definition we gave, knowledge of the ruling. What's the difference? The difference is that essentially uh, the first definition requires somebody. Somebody has to be, somebody has to know, all right? Somebody has to know the rulings. It requires somebody being studying and knowing the rulings. The second definition is that fiqh is the rulings themselves. Right? So it's really technical. We're not going to really uh, stay on this point too long. But uh, we can either say fiqh is knowledge of the rulings, in which, in, in which case it requires somebody to know the, the knowledge of the rulings. Or fiqh is the, the rulings themselves. Right? So if salah is wajib. This is fiqh. Right? Knowing salah is wajib. This is also fiqh, but it requires a person to know. All right? So this it gets a bit technical. We're not going to uh, delve too, too deep into that. Uh, but this is essentially the, uh, the two definitions of fiqh. All right, uh, moving on. How is fiqh connected to Islamic creed? All right? uh, so we went over the hadith of Jibreel right, way back earlier. And we said that this entire religion right, revolves around all right, uh, iman, Islam, ihsan. All right, iman goes back to our core beliefs, our beliefs, the beliefs in the heart. Uh, and then Islam is the outer actions, right? the, the translated outer actions of that iman that's in the heart, its appearance on the limbs, the appearance on the tongue, that is Islam. And this is essentially what fiqh is. And now we have ihsan, which is spirituality, right? The science of spirituality. Uh, and this is the third branch of uh, the religion. All right, so how is fiqh connected to Islamic creed? How are your beliefs connected to your actions? Your actions, your salah, your zakah, uh, and so on. Uh, one of the particularities of Islamic fiqh, uh, which, as we have said, is the legal ruling. So fiqh is the legal rulings. How does this connect to your creed, your beliefs? Uh, so one of the particularities of Islamic fiqh, which, as we said, is legal rulings that regulate the actions and statements of those who are legally responsible, is that it is firmly attached to faith. There is a connection between the two. Right? In other words, the person uh, who prays, right, the person who prays, they're not praying just to, for the sake of praying. There is an inner belief that is driving them to pray. All right? The person who gives the zakah, they're not just giving the zakah because they are a child of a person. All right? They're giving the zakah because there is a creed inside that is driving them to do that. And this goes for all of the, uh, all of the legal rulings that... It goes back to your beliefs, and that is what determines whether the person will be uh, fulfilling their legal obligations or not. All right, and we'll get we'll give examples of that. This is, that is because the creed of faith in Allah, the exalted, is that which makes the Muslim adhere to the rulings of the religion and drives him toward applying them willingly and voluntarily. Why do you pray? Because there's a belief in your heart that Allah is commanding me to pray. All right, let's compare that to a person who is. Uh, you know, you're stopping at the red light. Why are you stopping at the red light? Right. For most people, right, or the stop sign. So let's make it even more specific. It's 1 o'clock in the night, right, 1 o'clock at night, and there's nobody, there's nobody there. So you know that the, the wisdom of the law is not, is, has, has no meaning anymore, right? Because nobody's around. But you still stop at the stoplight. Why? You don't want to get a ticket. <laughs> Right? Right? You, want, you, don't, you don't want to get a ticket. Right? So there's something driving you to, to, to obey the, 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 you know, the secular laws. Right? For the Muslim, the reason why you're praying, you're giving zakat, is coming back to your belief that Allah has commanded me to do that. Allah has ordered me to do that, and that's why I'm doing it. Right? And if I don't do this, then it's, uh, I might be potentially punished, or I, might, uh, or I will get reward if I do it, or I may be potentially punished if I do not do so. So every uh, legal ruling, it goes back to creed, whether a person applies the legal ruling or not. It goes back to creed. All right? And if you don't have that belief, then you're not going to follow through with it. Unless it, unless it might go back to a person might be doing it for other reasons. Right? A person might be doing it for show or some other reason. But uh, for a person to sincerely pray, it goes back to their belief, right? their creed. No, it doesn't count. All right, you have to. Of course, you, uh, the, the condition for any action is belief, right? Proper belief. 
All right, uh, so <clears throat> it is also because whoever does not believe in Allah, the exalted, is not bound by prayer and fasting and is not concerned with whether his actions are lawful or unlawful. Right, a person who does not believe in Allah, then what reason do they have to pray? All right, why, would you, why do they need to pray? They don't believe in Allah to begin with. All right, so they will, and this is what we see for, you know, uh, people who are, who are doing all kinds of things, right? Uh, they, they don't have any belief, especially those who don't believe in uh, punishment, uh, reward in, in the next life. So, you know, they'll do anything in this life because there's nothing, there's nothing built on that. They don't believe in an afterlife where there's punishment or reward. So they'll do anything uh, and, any, and everything. All right? So, but uh, for Muslims, our, all the legal rulings, they go back to uh, our faith and our belief. And there are a number of examples of this in the Quran, and we'll, we'll mention a number of examples that show the connection between your beliefs and the legal rulings. All right, so for example, Allah commanded purification and He made it from the necessities of faith. All right, Allah commanded purification. And the verse in the Quran, what does Allah say? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. Ida qumtum ila salati faqsidu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum ila al murafiq until the end of the verse. How does Allah begin the verse of wudu? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. He addresses those who believe, all you who believe. In other words, Allah is saying that the only people who are going to be making with this wudu are those who believe. Right, the, only, the only person who will be making wudu is one who believes that Allah has ordered me to do the wudu. Right, otherwise, uh, nobody would make wudu just for fun. All right, another verse, Allah talks about uh, prayer and zakah. And He joins between them and belief in the last day. Right, this, uh, this is a verse in the Quran. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِينُونَ Those who establish the salah and they give the zakah and then Allah mentioned right after that, وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِينُونَ And in the uh, hereafter, they have certain belief. So Allah connects the two between the one who prays, the one who gives the cat, and the one who believes in the last day. There's a connection between the two. Right? In other words, the one who prays and gives the cat, they believe that there is a last day. They believe there's a day when they're going to be asked about these things. They're going to be asked about their salah. They're going to be asked about their zakah. And because of this belief in the last day, this is why they are fulfilling these uh, obligations. All right, in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, talking about fasting, right? We know the well-known verse of fasting. Uh, how does Allah begin the verse of fasting? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin. Once again, O you who believe, kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. All right, once again, join the connection between belief and legal ruling. So the legal ruling is that you have to fast. The legal, legal ruling is that fasting is obligatory. But Allah is addressing who? Those who believe. Because it is only those who believe are going to fast. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Alright, uh, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the qualities of the believers. Qad aflaha al-mu'minun. The believers are successful. And then Allah mentions a number of qualities of these believers. They are those alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. They are those who are humble in their prayer. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِدُونَ They are those who turn away from uh, vain talk. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ And they are those who give the zakah. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِذُونَ They are those who guard their private parts. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ Except uh, for their wives and what their right, right hand possesses, for those there is no blame. فَمَنِ ابْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الْعَدُونَ Whoever uh, seeks anything beyond that and desires anything beyond that, then they are, they are those who have gone beyond the limits. Uh, and they are those who وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَادِهِمْ رَاعُونَ And they are those who fulfill their trust, honor their trust and their contracts. Uh, and they are those وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَوَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِذُونَ They are those who uh, they guard and safeguard their prayer. أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ And they are, they, these, are, these people who have these qualities. What does Allah say at the end? أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ They are those who inherit the paradise. So Allah connects between doing all these actions, all right, these legal rulings. All, right, all these things are either range from being mandatory or recommended. Uh, and the connection is that those who do these things, in the next life they will have firdaus. الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ uh, such are the people are the inheritors of Firdaus, the uh, highest level in paradise, 
remain, remaining forever therein. All right, another example of the connection between beliefs and uh, legal rulings. Allah has commanded women to be treated well. All right, women to be treated well. And he says, uh, addressing the believers, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا يَحِلُّ لَكُمْ أَن تَرِثُوا النِّسَاءَ كَرْهَا O you who believe, it is not lawful for you to inherit women by force. Uh, so, uh, they used to, in Jahiliyyah, they used to have uh, a practice where uh, when a person would die, then uh, one of the relatives would forcefully marry the woman. The woman would not have a choice, right? The woman would not have a choice. So once her husband dies, then she would be forced to marry one of the, one of the relatives uh, of the deceased person. So it, was, it, it, it is as if uh, the, you know, the woman is just basically passed to the, ne the nearest relative. So this was, of course, uh, banned in Islam. And Allah has commanded us that we're not allowed to. Uh, no, one is, no one inherits women. Right? You inherit the wealth, but you cannot inherit the, 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 the woman. So it is not lawful for you to inherit women by force. Nor may you treat them harshly. Nor may you treat them harshly so that you can make off with part of what you have given them unless they commit an act of flagrant indecency. All right, so a person is not, uh, should not, should not treat uh, the women harshly so that you can basically uh, use that as an excuse to not pay the mahra. All right, so everyone, when a person gets married, they take that legal obligation to pay the, the, the dowry. All right? They have to pay the dowry. And uh, a person might, if they don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they might try to get off this obligation uh, and use the you know, excuse of, well, you know, the, you know, the, the wife is not doing certain things. And they might use that as an excuse. Uh, or they might treat the, the women harshly to trigger a response. Right? So they treat the women harshly to trigger a response. And then because of that response and how she behaves afterwards, then they say, well, I'm not uh, obligated to you know, give her the dowry in full and, or so on and so forth. Right? So Allah has, uh, has prohibited a person from treating the women harshly. Uh, and then he says after that, uh, And uh, live together with them. Bil ma'roof. Live together with them in, in, in courtesy and in good faith. Uh, and if you dislike them, it may be well that you dislike something which Allah has placed much good. Alright, so, uh, right, so uh, all this is uh, examples of uh, if a, a person who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who does not have that iman inside, then they will not be applying any of these rulings. Right? Uh, they will not be treating, the, they won't have any. Uh, reason really to treat the women well or give the dowry to the women uh, unless it's part of their good character their good nature right but there won't be any external reason to do that all right another example is uh, for the divorced woman all right the divorced woman if a woman is divorced she has to wait uh, three periods and Allah has commanded her not to conceal what is in the womb so it's possible that a, a woman is divorced and she might be pregnant right she might be pregnant and Allah has ordered her to if she is pregnant, she needs to say she's pregnant. She, she cannot hide that information, right? So because sometimes a person, uh, a woman, especially if she has some uh, uh, bad relationship with the, with the ex-husband, she might want to hide that and not let him know that she's pregnant with his child. Uh, so Allah has commanded the woman to wait three periods, right? The period of uh, where they have to wait, and also not to conceal if she's hiding anything in the womb. And Allah connects this to belief in the last day. So Allah says, وَالْمُطَلَّقَاتُ يَتَرَبَّسْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءَ The divorced woman, she has to wait three periods. Right? Three periods. وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَهُنَّ أَنْ يَكْتُمْنَ مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ فِي أَرْحَامِهِنَّ And it's not allowed for her to conceal what Allah has created in their wombs. Meaning if she's pregnant, she must say that. And then Allah uh, says at the end of the verse, who is the one who's going to do this? Who is the woman who... If she's pregnant and she's divorced, she's going to tell the husband that she's pregnant and she's not going to hide it. Just the woman who believes in Allah in the last day. In kunna yu'minna billahi wal yawm al-akhir. If they have faith in Allah in the last day, right? Because we know, especially when it comes to divorce, uh, these are things where uh, a person they don't have iman in Allah subhanahu wa taala, they will try to take other uh, the other spouse's rights, right? So. A man, 
he might be obligated to, if, especially the woman is pregnant, even if he divorces her, he still has to provide for her. All right? What is, what is, it, what is it that's going to uh, make sure that he provides for the woman that he's just divorced? Especially if they had a bitter and ugly divorce. Right? What is it going to make him fulfill this obligation? It is his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because uh, in situations like this, and we, and we see this happen all the time, and people go to court and they're trying to, each, each side is going to try to take uh, whatever they can get. Right? The woman will try to take everything that she can get from the husband, the ex-husband. Right? The husband might try to take everything that he can take from the wife. Right? What, is it, what is it that will keep these two parties in line and make sure that each takes, uh, fulfills their obligations? It is belief uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah warns the women, right? uh, you have to wait the three periods if you're divorced and if you're pregnant. Then do not conceal what is in the wombs. In kunna yu'minna billahi wal yawm al-akhir. If they do indeed have faith in Allah in the last day. All right. Uh, another example. Allah has uh, has ordered us avoid things like wine, drinking alcohol, gambling, idols, divination. Ya ayuhal ladina amanu. Allah addresses believers. All right. Once again, connecting belief with staying away from the prohibitions. O you who believe, ya ayuhal ladina amanu. Inna al khamr wal maisir wal ansab wal azlamu rijis sun. Oh, you who believe, wine, gambling, idols, divining arrows, all these things are filth and they are from the handiwork of the shaitan. So avoid them, avoid them uh, in hope that you will be successful. And the beginning of the verse is, Oh, you who believe, oh, you who believe, meaning the people who avoid these things are those who believe, only those who believe. All right, when it comes to riba, usury, major sin. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, once, uh, once again, He addresses believers to avoid the riba. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. When Allah wants to prohibit riba in the Qur'an, He says, O you who believe, la ta'kulu riba adha'afa mudha'afa. O you who believe, do not consume users' gain. Multiplied and then re-multiplied. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Have taqwa of Allah so that you may be successful. Uh, and then Allah says also, talking about riba, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, taqwa Allah. وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِي مِنَ الْرِبَى إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ All you who believe have taqwa of Allah and leave off whatever remains from usury. And then at the end of the verse he says, إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ If you're truly believers. All right, so all this is showing that the legal rulings, they are connected to your belief. And the one who adheres to the legal rulings is the one who has belief in their heart that Allah is the one who has commanded these legal rulings. And if you don't have belief uh, in your heart that Allah has commanded these legal rulings, then it's very likely and very possible that a person will not adhere to the legal rulings, what is obligatory, what is, uh, what is prohibited, and so on. All right, uh, after that, inshallah, in the next session, we'll talk about what uh, do we actually study in fiqh. So there are different uh, sub-chapters of fiqh. We'll discuss that, inshallah, uh, in the next session. Uh, so we'll conclude with that for today. Sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. If you have any questions, we can take that uh, before we conclude. Yes. It doesn't mean that you don't have belief, but it, it means that the one who is going to be... Uh, Diligent in applying the legal rulings is the one who has belief, all right. But but a person not applying the legal rulings, this can come. This does not necessarily mean that they don't have belief. It could be other factors: laziness. A person can just be lazy. Forgetfulness it could come down to forgetfulness. It could come down to other re uh, other reasons, right? Uh, but the, what, 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 we're, what we're talking about is the thing that drives you to do it. What drives you to pray, right? What drives you to pray? It is your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? What drives a divorced woman to say to the ex-husband that I have a baby in the, in the womb, that, that, that's your child, right? Instead of concealing it from him and, and hiding that from him and then not letting him know, right? It, it, it comes back to belief, right? Otherwise, it is very possible that that woman will conceal it and she won't let the ex-husband know and she will raise the child as if he doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with him, right? And it's very possible. Or maybe she, in her own goodwill and good character, she will tell him, maybe, right? But what uh, will cause her to 
adhere to these rulings is her belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the last day. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, good. So the question is, we have these schools of fiqh, and they're all going back to the same sources, but yet they're coming with different results. All right? So if they're going back to the same sources, then why are there different results? Uh, that's an excellent question. We're actually going to address that towards the end of the session. Uh, not this session, the, 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 the four-week session. But we will be addressing that. But in short and brief, the text of the Quran and Sunnah, we can divide them into two categories. You have those that are clear. Clear. There's, there, there's no need for interpretation. Right? Yeah, right. Allah says, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ uh, الصلاة. Right. You don't need anybody to tell you that you need to pray. Right? But then there are others. There are other, uh, another category which is open to interpretation. Right? And uh, the scholars say that the, the text of the Quran, especially the Quran and the Sunnah as well, it is hamalatu awjuh. It can accommodate different interpretations. It can accommodate different meanings. Right? So depending on this, the, right, this Arabic word, it can mean this, it can mean that as well. All right? So based on that, and there are other reasons, right? but this is one, one possible reason, All right? is that it can go both ways. The text can go this way, and it can go this way. All right? So this scholar will go this way. Another scholar will take it and interpret it a, diff a different way. All right? So because uh, the text can be interpreted in different ways, this is one amongst other reasons why there are differences, and we'll be addressing that, inshallah, in, in the in session. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, well, we'll, do, uh, well, yeah, we'll keep that for later, but just the point you mentioned uh, about the Quran. Did, uh, so the, the, the question is about the Quran, right? If we're sort of some interpreted the entire Quran, then why is there differences in the Quran? Um, but he actually did not interpret everything in the Quran, right? So there are things he, that he did interpret, and he told them, and there are things that he did not explicitly say, right? And one of them is the verse we mentioned in the, uh, in, about the divorce woman. That the woman has to wait three quru. Right? This word qar in Arabic, it means, it can either mean uh, menstruation, or it can mean the purity between menstruation. And depending on the meaning, it has two, it, the, the period of when, when a woman waits, it can be two different waiting periods. And both of these are supported in the Arabic language. Right? The word has two meanings. And both of them are valid in the Arabic language. And we don't have anything from Rasulullah where he told them what is the meaning of Qur. Right? He didn't, there's nothing authentic on that. So based on that, the scholars split. Right? And it's like an even split. Right, you have half of the scholars of Madahib say this, the other half say the other. Right, based on that. So he did not interpret everything. And because he didn't, if he did, then it would be, even if, even if he did interpret everything, it would still be open because then we would need to determine the authenticity of the hadith that, which, which he did interpret. Right? So we also go back to that. Uh, we'll go back to hadith sciences as well. 
right? So it, 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 it is, there is a process. But what, inshallah, we'll be discussing uh, that in a little bit more detail after we have a little bit more idea of what fiqh is, inshallah. All right, we'll take uh, last question because we have the event coming up. Go ahead. We'll talk about that as well afterwards, right? As well afterwards. That question will come up. Essentially, uh, you are required to follow the Quran and Sunnah, right? We all agree on that. Uh, but if you don't have the necessary qualifications, then you are required to ask those who don't, do know. Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ All right, what does that mean? We'll talk about that. Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Now, what does that actually mean? Does that mean school of thought? Does it mean... Any scholar, does it mean the person down the street? All right, what does it mean? But in, in short, if you do not know, you have to ask those who know, right? Those who know. And what that, uh, what that entails, well, that will be a different discussion, inshallah. But you're asking all the, the, the questions that we wanted to say for the last session. That's coming out now, but uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about that in uh, maybe the fourth session, inshallah. Yes. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. We'll, all right, so we'll pause. Yeah, we'll pause now, inshallah. Well, we have uh, refreshments in the back for everyone, available for everyone. Inshallah, refreshments in the back. Uh, and then uh, we'll proceed to Salat of Isha afterwards. Jazakumullah khayran. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa baraka alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Subhanakullah, wa bihamdik. Nashadu Allah, ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.